we have a packed agenda today. I'll first talk about the four-man birthday event that happened two weeks ago. Then Nofa will talk about fixing ignored passwords in Ansible job templates. Then it will be on Jeremy to explain attaching hosts to multiple content views. Then Samir about repo discovery update. Then Maximilian about reviewing PRs on GitHub. Then Gerija about NVMe controllers. And we'll have a demo by William about Git repo role for develop, develop environments. So let me start with introducing the form and birthday event. It took place two weeks ago in Garching by München and was hosted by Attics to celebrate the fact that Foreman turned 15. I had the pleasure of attending, so let me say a few words about how it went. Well, first of all, there was a cake. It was delicious. Uh, the flavor was apples, I believe. But apart from the cake, several community members gave talks presenting ongoing projects and recent success stories. The topics uh, were automated provisioning with Secure Boot. There was a nice community success story around integrating here a data manager with Foreman. Then we heard about CI testing landscape and the migration from Jenkins to GitHub Actions. Then we listened to a talk about the opportunities and caveats of managing Linux desktops with Foreman. Then the documentation team gave their annual status update. And to co conclude the talk part, uh, we, we listened to a talk on pushing containers to Catello. Slide decks are available on the forum online. I'll share the link after the demo. And what I want to say is that I want to thank the Attics folks for hosting the event. It was really enjoyable. And let's look forward to the next year's celebration, which should be hosted by Netways, if I recall correctly. And now I want to ask if there's anyone else who would like to perhaps uh, share their impressions from the event or talk about any other form and birthday they remember. So is there anyone? Um, yeah, um, I'm just going to go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks for the kind words. Uh, I also had uh, had a lot of fun at the birthday party. It was yeah great meeting some people that you only uh, interact um, over the wire basically all year long, and then you can finally meet them and see them. And yeah, that was uh, that was great. And yeah, we had lots of uh, yeah like small technical or or, or other um, off the record discussions. And yeah, I enjoyed that a lot, to be honest. Um, yeah, so it was fun. Okay, thank you, Maximilian. Uh, I don't think we have anyone else on the call who attended. So unless anyone really wants to speak, I will give the word to Nofar now. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I raised my hand. I wanted to ask about the birthday event. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it. It was a little bit far for me. Um, I wanted to ask if anyone knows if there is a place I can watch maybe recordings, if some of the talks were uh, recorded. So I, I believe, don't... oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Maximilian, that's all right. Yeah, I, I don't believe there are any recordings, if at all. It could have been Ian's talk um, because Ian also was only there virtually. Um, but I actually don't know if uh, if it was recorded in Google Meet. OK, OK, I so let's decide that uh, we can check that. And um, I will share the link to the post. I'm sending it in the chat now. And we can actually communicate there and publish and recordings. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it for this topic. Okay, so let me share my screen. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'm going to share my entire screen. Okay. 
Okay. And uh, so today I will show you a new fix uh, that we made in the Smart Proxy Ansible PR, um, the Smart Proxy Ansible plugin. Um, so this is the fix. Basically, what happened was that if you try to run uh, Ansible jobs from Foreman, um, the SSH password and the effective user password um, weren't reflected when you actually ran the job. So let me show you how it looks like. Um, for example, I have this host and I have these two Ansible walls I would like to run on this host. Um, let me show you. Well, the ping roll is just uh, printing the user, the machine's name. And the print user, I can share with you how the, uh, the playbook, how the role looks like. Uh, so let me clear and do it again. Print users. This is the role I was talking about. Just to print the Ansible SSH user and the Ansible become user. This is what this role do does. And if I go to run Ansible roles, actually or not, I will schedule a job. And Ansible roles because I want to show you the form how it looks like. So here under advanced fields. We have the SSH user, the effective user, and also we have the password and the private and the effective user password. So until now, if you entered the password or the effective user password from this form, unfortunately, it wouldn't have worked um, because we were overriding these fields by the default. So the default comes from the settings. If you go to settings and under the remote execution tab, you have here the SSH user, the effective user, and the default SSH password and the effective user password. So this, this password from here would be overwritten by the values from here. And after we fix that bug, you can now over you can now use uh, this form and it will work. Now, the reason I think uh, we had this bug is because I think almost all users um, are not using, um, are not manually typing the words from the form. I think they're uh, either using um, the SSH uh, authentication um, by default. So I think this is the main reason they weren't, uh, we didn't notice this bug basically. And I can demonstrate it with uh, with an example. Um, so here I have this document. Uh, I wrote basically what is the Ansible SSH user and the Ansible become user for uh, whoever is not familiar with these terms. So the Ansible SSH user obviously is just the SSH uh, user to uh, that establishes the connection, and the become become user is the user that actually performs um, the tasks. If we have it, um, um, if we are requiring it, if it is being used. Um, okay, so I have these users here. So if you notice from the settings, I have the SSH user set to setting SSH user and the effective user set to settings effective user. I tried to make it as clear as possible, but uh, I wasn't sure how to do it. And the default SSH password, well, you can't see it here, but basically the passwords are these two. And I will basically just run this uh, Ansible roles without changing anything here. So the users and the password should be taken from here. Um, yeah, okay, let's run. Okay, success. And let's see the results. So ping, it's just pinging. Uh, I can see the address of my machine. And print the SSH user as uh, we wanted is the setting SSH user and the setting effective user. Now I'll do the same thing, but I will try to override um, these users. Now, you know what? 
Let me try first to override the passwords so we can see um, the new feature is working. OK, uh, so now the password, I will type just the wrong password. You can see it, but um, it's not the right one. I'm just typing gibberish. Uh, OK, and let's run it. Let's hope my, <laughs> I won't have any errors because sometimes uh, like the cache is not refreshed. So let's see. Fingers crossed. Great, failed. Let's see why. Message incorrect uh, SU password. As you can see, I'm using the effective uh, user method. I'm using SU instead of uh, another option. So great. I'm happy to see uh, <laughs> it didn't work. Um, let's run it again, but this time let's use a, another user. So you see now the SSH user is empty. So this time I will use that Rex SSH user. And Rex SSH password, which is here. And also let's change the effective user. So the Rex effective user. Mm, yep. And also the Rex effective password. Sorry, this is an old one. And yeah, effective user password. And uh, this one should uh, run without any errors because the user and password are correct. Great. We can do one last uh, check. Yeah. Rex SSH user and Rex effective user um, as expected. So I think that's it. This is the bug fix. Let's see, I covered everything. Um, yeah. Any questions about this? Okay, I guess now. Uh, so thank you. That that is all for me. Yeah, thank you, Mopa. Let's go to the next topic, which is Jeremy's attaching host to multiple content views. All right. Hey, everyone. Let me share my screen here. Hopefully everyone can see my screen and hear me. If not, uh, please let me know. Uh, I'm Jeremy from the Catella team, and today I am here to tell you about uh, the multiple content views feature. Uh, so we've, we've actually had the beginnings of this in place since Catella 4.8. Uh, we, we put some backend changes in place. And since then, it's been uh, a little bit unfortunate because there have been several bugs that we've had to fix around those backend changes. And uh, the, the beginnings of the feature were there, but it wasn't really enough to make it usable. So it, it's like users have been getting all of the bugs, but none of the benefits of this new feature. But uh, now with Catella 4.14, finally, that is going to change. So how does multiple content views work? So, as we, uh, as you know, basic concept of Catello software lifecycle is that a host is assigned to a particular content view and lifecycle environment. And it's the combination of that content view and lifecycle environment that determines what content your host can access. Uh, like when you go to do a software update or install a package or et cetera. Um, and that works for most of the basic use cases of uh, Catello. Uh, if you have a little bit more complicated content curation needs, um, we also offer composite content views. So that's uh, if you need to combine the content of two or more uh, content view versions and assign your host to that combined, uh, or we call it a composite content view, you can do that as well. Um, but the the disadvantage of that is 
it, it really increases the need to publish content views because you have to, whenever any of the underlying content views is published, you also have to publish the composite. Uh, and until you do that, your host isn't gonna get the updates. So that can, can scale a little bit, but only so much. Uh, if you have even more complicated content curation needs, like if you're doing publishes uh, every hour or every day, uh, that many content view publishes can get really um, unmanageable. So it was um, it was those type of users that asked us for this multiple content view feature. Um, and so what I want to do first is I'll I'll show you what's there already. I, I did do a demo back in Catello four eight time of what was there, but uh, some people may not have seen that. So I'm I'm just gonna sort of talk about it today as if it's the first time people have seen it. Uh, and that way we'll cover everything that's there. Um, I'm gonna cover what's already there and then we're gonna move on to what's new. And then I'll tell you about our plans for the future. All right, so I have my content views here. Um, and let me show you my terminal. Hopefully everyone can see that. And this is our, uh, this is our host. And if I have a host, there's a couple commands I can run on it to see what content view and lifecycle environment is attached to the host. And these are subscription manager commands. Um, so I can do subscription manager environments list enabled. And I can see here uh, that it's attached to uh, my, my, uh, my lifecycle environment is named env1. My content view is named cv1. So you'll see uh, that the format there is lifecycle environment label slash content view label. That's gonna be important later. But anyway, you can see that's the environment that my host is attached to. Now this is regular old single environment host. I can also do subscription manager repos and it will show me uh, this is the single repository that happens to be in this content view. It's showing me this repository uh, and that's what my host has access to. Um, so how do I get my host attached to multiple content views? Unfortunately, uh, the feature still does not work with global registration or activation keys. So um, what I have to do is first unregister my system. And then I have to, there's a subscription manager command that I can run. Uh, subscription manager register. And uh, I can pass in this param environments. And it's a comma separated list of environments. So I'm going to attach it to this one. And let's do three. And now is a good time for me to remind you that this is all controlled by a setting. So if that setting's turned off, I'm gonna get this error like this. Registering to multiple environments is not enabled. That setting is uh, defaulting to off. So if I go back to my web UI, I'm gonna turn this setting on. If I can click the right place, it's under content, allow multiple content views. I set that to yes. And now that I've set that setting, I'm going to repeat that command and it's going to let me register to multiple environments. All right, now I'm registered again. And now I can do that uh, subscription manager environments list enabled and I'll confirm I'm now registered to multiple environments. It shows me both of those content view environments there. Uh, by the way, we call them content view environments. Uh, I want people to get into the habit of uh, that saying that new term. So before you'd have it attached to a single content view and lifecycle environment. Uh, but now we have this con concept of content view environments and a content view environment is simply a combination of a particular content view and lifecycle environment. Uh, and now you can attach your host to multiple content view environments. So if we do our uh, subscription manager repos command again, we're gonna see something different this time. And uh, now I see that we have 
both of these repos in here. I have both the um, that repo I had before, and I have uh, the repo that's in the content view three. So we have access to both of those repos uh, from both of those content view environments. Uh, also, going back to the web UI, if I go to my post details view, I also want to show you this. Um, if I go to repository sets and I have my limit to environment, which defaults to on, um, this banner is still kind of a lie because it's actually showing me all environments and not just that one. But other than that, this, this list of repositories is correct. Um, the reason you see the rel eight and a rel nine here is because the, uh, it's a rel nine host and it won't show me the rel eight repo, but it, it is showing the, uh, the repository sets that are in my host environments, plural. Uh, so that is already in place. Everything I've uh, been saying up until now, uh, you have been able to do since Catella 4.8. Uh, you can do that right now. So now let's get into what's new. If I go to my overview here, uh, the content view environments card here used to be the content view details card that's now updated. And it displays, uh, you can see it displays both of them here in order. Uh, just a side note, if I go to change uh, the content view environment, we haven't built that yet into the web UI. So I'm going to get a warning banner here, and it's just going to tell me, hey, if, uh, if you change it here, your host is going to go back to being a single environment host, and it will be removed from the other environments. Uh, and then the second web UI change is there's a new column that we've added or that you can add. Uh, called content view environments and if you have multiple it'll show you a little badge here and then the names and you can also click on it get a little pop-up of uh, the details there all right so going back to my terminal there's a couple new things that you can do in the terminal as well so back on my host there is a new command well it's new to us really it's subscription manager environments, dash, dash, set. And what this can do is it, it takes a list, a comma separated list of environments, just like it did to register. So I can actually change it after registration now. Let's change it to uh, one and two. And of course I forgot my I'm going to put my username and password in there. OK, so now I can um, confirm that that changed. Now it's uh, before it was 1 and 3. Now it's 1 and 2. So my, uh, my host environments have changed. Uh, and that in that way, you can set uh, environments on the host after it's registered. Um, now, Subscription Manager has actually had this command for a while now, um, but it hasn't worked well with Catello until Catello 4.13.1. So uh, you can actually do this right now. If you have 4.13.1 or later, uh, this set command will work well. If you have 4.13.0 or older than that, please don't try this because then Catello and Candlepin will be out of sync and very weird things will happen. Um, OK, so anyway, you can, you can set it like that on the host. Or if I wanted to do this on the server side, you can also do this with Hammer. So here's my Hammer. Um, first, let me get what the ID of my host is. My ID is 3. So I can do hammer host update ID three. And here, instead of environments, it's content view environments. And then it takes a, a list in that same format of uh, lifecycle environment label slash content view label. Um, oh, I forgot my dash dash. All right, it says host updated, and I can now go back to my host. 
I suppose I just updated it with the same environments that were already there. Let's do uh, something else so that I can prove that it worked. Let's do one and three. Host updated. And now it's confirmed on the host. They're reassigned on the host as well. Now, with Hammer, we've also added a second param. You can do uh, content view environment IDs. And you can do something like uh, this. But to be honest, I never expect humans to actually use that because there's no good way to know what and uh, what IDs to pass in there. And it's it's meant more for the web UI to use. Uh, but just for completeness, I'm letting you know that that's there as well. Um, so you may be wondering what happens if uh, what happens if I turn the setting off? What will happen to my hosts? And the answer is nothing. Um, the setting only affects what you can set. So um, all of my hosts will continue. If I have multiple environment hosts and I turn this setting off, they'll continue working as normal. Um, and so you can see here, I've got the setting off now. Hammer's giving me an error. Uh, subscription manager environments will also give me an error. However, if I back that out and just try to assign a single environment, it will still let me do that. So again, when the setting is off, you can change it back to a single environment. You just cannot reassign multiple environment hosts. So uh, that is pretty much it for the changes for now. Our plan for the future of this, um, this is actually a pretty big feature to build. And so we've, we rearranged it a little bit uh, so that it would be, uh, so that we can get you something useful sooner. So for that reason, we're delaying the big web UI changes a little bit. And we're going to do uh, hosts, hammer, and API. That's done already. And then next is activation keys, hammer, and API only. And then only after that, we're going to make the web UI changes so you can actually change that stuff uh, in the web UI. Uh, Ansible support is also planned. Evgeny has indicated interest in contributing. So uh, look for that maybe in the coming months. And then finally, after all that, uh, we plan to add it to host groups. So that is our plan. And uh, as always, happy to take any questions. Doesn't look like there's any. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jeremy. And if there really are no questions, And let me resume the slide deck. And we can go to Samir's repo discovery update. Samir. Hey, uh, no, all right. Uh, let me try sharing my whole screen. All right, good morning, folks. Uh, I have two updates for today. Both of them are kind of infra level and installer level. So these should not affect any user flows. But uh, if you are an admin and you're seeing some packages moving around, then this should explain that. So the first update is around repo discovery. If you're not familiar with the flow, let me just quick a quick demo. So you can run repo discovery in Catello uh, from the products index page. So we have a repo discovery button here. And what this does, it supports two uh, repository types right now, yum and container. So let me do it for yum. You can use any uh, URL which is hosting any repositories for you. And you simply put the URL here. If it's uh, authenticated, you can provide your username, password, and then you can run discover. So what this does is it goes to this URL, and it basically 
crawls through this uh, URL web page and looks at all the repositories that might be available or hosted at this endpoint. Uh, is my terminal running? Okay, yeah, it was done. So it was able to discover all of these repositories hosted at this URL, and then you can go ahead and select any repository you want to create from these discovered repository. You can update the name, and you can run repository creation. And then you get this repository created, and you can go look at the repository which was created. So this will autofill some of the uh, details that you might have, and then you can update anything else that you need, for example, like on demand, etc. So this is repo discovery. This uh, workflow was using a gem which had gotten quite old. The last update was 2012. So as you can expect, it wasn't working on EL9. It wasn't working on upgraded Ruby. So uh, just in time, we switched the implementation from this old gem to this newer gem, which is getting regular updates, at least uh, for compatibility with newer versions of Ruby. So now this whole workflow uses a new gem, and we have stopped packaging Animini, and it should no longer get installed on new installations. Uh, and your repo discovery should continue to work as it used to, so there is no change in the user workflow. Uh, all right, and a similar update around uh, PostgreSQL EVR extension that we used to install, which, uh, so let me give some context there. So when you sync packages and when your host has some installed packages, we compare if the host can update those packages based on calculations on the EVR. So EVR is epoch version release, so that gives us the information to see if any host has any applicable irata to upgrade, et cetera. So we had, uh, we still have a special type, it's called EVR type, and we have some more constructs, so specifically a couple of triggers here, which is EVR insert trigger on installed packages, and similarly on RPM. So what this does is anytime an RPM is brought down to Catello, it runs this triggers, uh, this these two triggers. So one is on insert, another one is on update, and it populates the EVR uh, value for that new package. Similarly, it updates the EVR for installed packages on hooks. So it's quicker to compare these values to calculate applicability. Uh, this, uh, these types, these triggers used to live in a repository here, Foam and Postgres SQL EVR, and uh, it used to be packaged, and then you had to enable this extension on any database you were using. So if you if you were using an external managed DB, it would sometimes run into issues around root access and whatnot. So what we have done is we have moved this entire thing inside Catello, and now you don't need this external extension and everything lives inside of Catello. And we have two migrations that run. One is to support this for existing installations. So when you run an upgrade, it basically drops that extension that you would have had enabled, and it recreates all of these constructs inside of uh, Catello using this migration. And uh, we handle new installs differently. So for new installs, we never have to uh, enable that extension. And we can simply create all of the constructs for you, which include that new type and the triggers associated. Uh, so similar to the previous one, you should not see any differences. So any difference you see in applicability is a bug. So if you run into anything, just let us know. Uh, and yes, that's about it. All right. Well, thank you, Samir. Are there any questions?
it looks like there are not so let's go to the next topic which is reviewing prs on github by maximilian the floor is yours max uh, yeah thanks um so there's an open uh thread in the foreman community forum that i want to yeah highlight basically um and to everybody that's that's gonna watch this youtube video you can pause now and make up your mind before i try to convince you um of what i wanna um wanna share trying to share my screen um okay and yeah to everybody else that is live um this yeah time's over uh, so um basically um i wanna um yeah just just quickly go over this this uh post and our discussion and yeah try to encourage you um to follow up on this um so the discussion started about um the ways you can submit a review so yeah you all know this form basically comment approve and request changes um, and also about uh, different labels that you can set on prs and issues um, and that there's yeah different kinds of automations for example the pr uh, processor app that uh, reacts on certain labels and reacts on certain actions i believe um uh, yeah so uh yeah but basically i i believe it's always good to have interaction on on prs because well prs are our one of the main ways to to interact with other open source contributors so i think we should always encourage interaction and discussion um but when doing this i think there's sometimes a bit of a a um yeah put potential challenge misunderstanding downside whatever you want to name it um that uh, some contribute contributions um are yeah some contributors feel like um the contribution is blocked because there's many comments for example um and my idea was to kind of have a shared understanding of when to select the request changes um button on pr because uh, depending on the project setting on github uh, this um effectively blocks merging a pr by somebody else um so yeah I, I believe we should be mindful when when using this feature and basically only block a pr if it would really break something that is already yeah working supported or or break any other workflow or automation but if it's more of a ah, i like this better than that then it's maybe not um always a good idea to select the request um changes but i want to um yeah highlight once more this is just my personal opinion i would really love to see some more um some more comments some more feedback um and yeah i'm gonna post the link in chat and yeah it would be nice to have more uh, more discussion there maybe we can um yeah find a shared understanding write it down and communicate this to everybody yeah um, and i believe that was about it from my side if there's any um any comments yeah feel free to to comment now or um or have a look at the community forum thank you max are there any questions at this point it looks like there are not so let's all just agree to uh, take a look at uh, the link max shared and the next topic would be nvme controllers by girija but i don't think she's on the call yeah she's not here Okay, let's skip to the next one then. That will be a demo by William about the Git repo role for develop environments. So, William. Hi, thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Oh, 
Okay, can you see this all right? Font is large enough, everything's legible. Yeah. Great. Um, so this is a demo of something that we've had for uh, a little while now, but um, in the past due to some uh, laptop issues, I was not able to screen share, so I never presented this. So um, today uh, I'm happy to uh, tell everybody all about it. Um, so it's a really simple idea. It's just we have a new role uh, within the Forklift project, uh, which is the Git repo role. And you can use this for managing um, Git repositories in your development environment. So um, show you the structure of the role here. Um, and uh, there's a nice readme. Um, so if you're interested in using this and you want to check it out, everything should be documented pretty well, I feel like. Here are some examples. Um, explains uh, basically everything that the role does, um, which is pretty simple. It's uh, just a couple, couple different things. So it um, creates a, a local clone of a Git repository. Um, it, adds any arbitrary number of remotes um, and goes ahead and creates any arbitrary number of branches. And I've also added uh, very rudimentary features um, to do a bundle install after uh, setting up the repository or um, uh, do a pip install um, for uh, Python source. And um, so, you know, why would you be interested in using this? Well, maybe you are uh, interested in uh, working on a different branch, uh, Foreman or Catello. Uh, you know, the Puppet module has some tools to do that as well, but um, this role is really more fully featured. Um, or maybe you are developing a new plugin for Foreman. Right, and so there's uh, there's no support at all in the um, the standard like um, Puppet Catello Devel module for that, but um, this role makes setting that up easily. Uh, so in the left pane over here, I have um, this is my current development environment. Um, you can see I'm my Catello repository here. Um, Right, so um, I've got these repositories and remotes in particular um, set up how I prefer to have them, which is that um, I, uh, I clone from my branch first, and then I, um, I add the uh, upstream repository as an additional remote. So um, in particular, I'm on my master branch here, and I just um, fetched uh, from Catello upstream, and indeed there is some new stuff. Merge it here, right? And then I can also easily, the way I've set this up, I can just get push. Uh, and because um, my fork is the, the primary remote, you know, I never have to be afraid of, oh, am I gonna accidentally push something to uh, you know, uh, upstream organization uh, that's not ready or, or anything like that. I have it um, essentially set up uh, so that that won't be an issue. And I can just quickly show you, um, uh, let's do, yeah, so here is my, um, my dev box, and um, there's just a couple things that are relevant for the Git repo role. Um, in particular, let's see. Yeah, right here under the installer options, um, you'll see I have these uh, three options. So um, in the installer, we uh, added support to um, 
have externally managed uh, source repositories. And so I'm, I'm managing my source repositories with this Ansible role. So I don't need Puppet to do it. So I've just, um, this is our way of telling the Puppet module, you don't need to worry about it. Just assume that it's there. It's, you know, whether you're setting it up manually or, um, you know, using Ansible or something, this is just unmanaging those repositories. Um, and then, uh, yeah, down here, this is the, the data structure that the role expects. Um, so it ex expects a list of repositories. So here's a repository, here's a repository, here's a repository. Um, each one has a name and a path. Uh, and then remotes, uh, an ordered list, right? So I have my fork set as the, the primary remote. And then uh, from each remote, you can specify any number of branches. Um, you know, this configuration that I have here is pretty simple. I just initially have a single branch created. Here for Foreman, I have a single branch created. It's the develop branch. But again, this is under my uh, remote. So, um, you know, if, if I push to it, it's not going to push to upstream, uh, upstream formant this way. Um, yeah, and then uh, same thing, um, remote execution. See that the setup is almost identical for, for all three of these. Uh, and the other thing that's, I think, worth pointing out is that uh, I am using this install gems feature that I mentioned briefly. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, you can use this to, um, you know, if you want to unmanage your source repositories in the installer because you want to set up something different yourself, uh, this gives you a, a different way uh, that, you know, offers a lot more, uh, actually both the, um, in Puppet and in Ansible, the um, the built-in uh, tooling for working with Git repositories is uh, pretty limited, I would say. I This is kind of something I didn't expect necessarily to need to write such a role that can create multiple remotes and branches. But um, yeah, the, um, you know, Ansible's upstream approach uh, was kind of, hey, if you can't do this with just the, the very basic git role and the git config role, uh, you know, but I guess they think you should be able to do everything that way. But um, yeah, trying to trying to do this via um, git config, managing the git configuration directly uh, quickly got hard and messy. So I said, you know what, let's just write a simple role uh, that does this. And, you know, unlike the, um, unlike uh, what comes uh, already in the uh, built-in modules, uh, you know, this has much better support for uh, an arbitrary number of remotes, an arbitrary number of branches on each remote and so on. Uh, so yeah, that's, Pretty much it. If you want to manage your source repositories this way, you can do it. Also, if you um, like customizing your, your dev environment with different um, uh, packages or software, uh, some extra tools that you like to use, uh, but they're not available, or you need a, a newer version, you need to build it from source, yeah, this uh, role would be um, a fine way to approach doing that as well, I think. All right, thanks very much. And let me know if there are any questions. Thank you, William. I noticed there was a round of virtual applause. So good job on doing this demo. I don't see any questions in the chat. So does anyone on the Looks call like want to ask Max something? Max has one. Yeah, um, the question was, does it work with uh, any Plugin. And yeah, uh, that's a great question from Max. Uh, yeah, it should uh, work with any um, any plugin. The um, caveat is you would still uh, need to add some configuration um, 
in the puppet module. Um, yeah, there is a commit here. I think I worked on it some, and one of your colleagues worked on it some, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, I find it this way. No. Yeah, so this is the general idea right here. Right, and then let's see where this is. This is FS config. Yeah, so this is um, this is the parameter uh, you would need to use right here. This um, this extra plugins uh, parameter, and it, it expects. Uh, a certain structure, um, but uh, yeah, this is just to um, deploy any any extra uh, configuration so that Foreman knows about the the plugin and so on. Um, but in terms of like actually managing the um, uh, the source uh, repository, yeah, you could you could move that outside of Puppet. So um, it would be just to be clear about what it looks like today. Yeah, we have this um, this manage repo parameter, which is in the um, uh, the plugin define type, and uh, you would just uh, set manage repo to false for the plugin, and then you could use the um, the git repo role to. Uh, manage your source for it, which is really nice. If uh, you know it's a it's a new plugin and it doesn't exist in the Foreman uh, organization yet, then this is the way to do it. That's uh, an excellent question. Thanks, Max. Do we have any more questions for William? Looks like we don't. So I think that concludes today's demo. Unless there are any questions in general about any of the talks today. If not, then thanks everyone. Thanks to speakers for speaking. Thanks to listeners for listening. And the next demo uh, is scheduled for August 22nd. So I hope to see you all then. Thanks, Anita.